Welcome to the Designing Hollywood podcast in association with The John Campia Show. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood podcast show is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by the Costumes Rental Corporation. Today's guest is an award-winning Canadian Pakistani filmmaker whose debut film, In Flames, premiered at the 76th Cannes Film Festival as part of the Director's Fortnight. It marked the return of Pakistan to the Director's Fortnight after a period of 47 years. He is an alumnus of the TIFF Talent Lab and the Locarno Filmmakers Academy. His works have been screened and awarded in over 70 film festivals worldwide, including TIFF, Locarno, and BFI London. Born in Karachi and currently based out of Toronto, Khan is committed to telling stories that amplify historically marginalized communities. The film In Flames, which is his feature directorial debut, revolves around a mother and daughter whose precarious existence is ripped apart following the death of the family patriarch. In Flames has also played festivals including Toronto, Busan, Sitges, Helsinki, and South by Southwest Sydney. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome award-winning film director Zarar Khan to the Designing Hollywood podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Robert. That's a really intimidating bio you just gave, so I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think well-deserved. Now, you know, I have to say, I, I, I'm fascinated that you are both Tor from a Canadian, Pakistani-based filmmaker, because one of the things that I, I've found exciting is when we're getting stories from places that we don't see a lot of stories from. You know, I remember in terms of my experience with Pakistan in films, I remember seeing My Beautiful Laundrette back in the 80s, which was a movie about Pakistani immigration to England. And it was hard for an American to understand, wait, they're racist toward Pakistani people in Britain? Because we didn't, obviously, we didn't have the same thing and we didn't have what happened, you know, in Britain and the colonialism. colonialism. It so, was bad. Yeah, it was bad. And uh, we didn't have that in, in the United States. And it was a really interesting um, way of, of, I think, film filmmaking is some of the best way to learn about other cultures. And one of the things I, I thought about your film... Now, first of all, I have to ask, did you shoot it in Karachi? Yeah. It was... I, I mean... You, you know, I, I kept thinking about documentary style filmmaking in the early 70s and William Friedkin came to mind doing things like The French Connection and how it was very evocative of New York at the time. And one of the things when I, as soon from the moment the movie begins, you really get a sense of the place and the time. And I've never been to Karachi, I've never been to Pakistan, but um, I was just floored by the evocation of the city and its people immediately you just dropped me in to a world i'd never seen before and it immediately from your camera angles to the sound design and even the score i mean i felt wow i've this is something i haven't seen before and i was immediately captivated by it and you know i don't know how you did it but i want to find out and i think to to begin did you grow up in Karachi? And if so, were you a movie fan growing up? And what were your influences? Uh, I grew up, I was born in Karachi. And then my family migrated to Canada when I was 10. Oh, okay. And then I spent the following 20 years moving back and forth between Canada and Pakistan every five years. So I like, moved back when I was 15 to Pakistan, moved back to Canada when I was 19, moved back to Pakistan when I was 23. And then I spent the greater part of the last 10 years in Karachi, kind of developing my voice as a filmmaker and mm. i moved back to canada about a year and a half ago with the film so the last decade for me has largely been in karachi and that's also where i've been growing as a filmmaker and learning about cinema um i grew up in like a non-film family my mom was a librarian my dad is in finance so i remember the first film i saw in a theater was titanic which was in wow. islamabad which was like a censored version obviously for many reasons um, and uh, I didn't really grow up watching like world cinema but um, after I graduated I graduated in a theater degree 
And uh, theater was really what I did through most of my childhood. I, I always really enjoyed telling stories. But what a lot of real theater kids will tell you what they love about the medium is that, you know, when the curtains close, you're never going to experience that story again. And that's what I hated about theater. I hated that when it ended, I could <laughs> never revisit this story. So I started gravitating towards cinema. Um, after I graduated from my theater degree in Canada, I moved back to Pakistan and I was doing plays with my friends. And after that, we started doing short films together. Mm. And those short films were kind of my introduction, both to world cinema and also to like the kind of stories that I'm interested in telling. So I had a lot of success with a short film I made in 2018 called Bia. It premiered at Locarno. And it's a festival in like the Italian speaking part of Switzerland. And it was my first time being invited to present my film at an international festival. And I remember going there and having my mind suddenly like blown wide open with all of the different global types of cinema and meeting people from all corners of the world. And that kind of set me on a journey of attending labs and workshops and film training programs all across the world, from Korea, where I was training with Indonesian Otur Mali Sura, wow. back to Locarno for their lab, where we met with Bong Joon-ho and John Waters, to TED <laughs> where I met with Deepa Mehta, and uh, wow. just incredibly talented, generous filmmakers, and getting to meet them and then watch their films and learn about cinema and the medium of cinema this way. So for me, film was traveling and learning new cultures and learning new people, but also learning what I appreciate about Karachi and how I want to present Karachi because I felt a responsibility as a filmmaker from there and coming from a place that doesn't have a rich history of being shown cinematically. And I'm like, this is like the fifth largest city in the world and people don't know anything about it. You know, like I was in New York for the first time three weeks ago. You're uh, kidding. In Flames is Pakistan's uh, submission for the Oscars for this year. Unfortunately, we didn't go all the way but I was doing four-year consideration screenings like across America. And I remember driving into New York and being like, it's so weird because I feel like I've seen this city before because I've seen so many movies from here. <laughs> right. You know? I know how and that felt. <laughs> that's what I wanted to do with Karachi. One of the things I wanted to do was show people what the city feels like. Not necessarily what it looks like, but what it feels like. Well, you know, there there is an, it's a, there is an establishing shot uh, we're you're, you're up high and you see i think it's the the largest wide of the whole city i mean and i was stunned by this particular shot because you can see like the highway and then all the resident it go, that goes on forever i mean it looked like it was something out of blade runner but in the hot sun yeah, and i it's was a like city of 30 million people you i know, was like, like oh my god you know it, you I'd never seen that particular image of that city i'd never seen that before and it really i mean in terms of of you know, like I was saying before we started, I think cinema is the way to easily convey the experience of people around the world to audiences around the world because of the way cinema works. It actually shows these things to you. And that's one of the strengths. I mean, I loved to be, you did such a good job of immersing the audience in the world. And it was a world I'd never really experienced, just like you said. And that was, it immediately captured my interest. And I was like, oh, because I, like I told you, I went into this film cold, purposefully not knowing anything about it. Because how often do you get to do that these days? You know, you I mean, I watch a lot of foreign language movies, so I get to do it pretty frequently. But it's awful for me because I hate watching the big films because I have I come with so many expectations. Like I recently saw Poor Things, and I loved it. But man, I went in being like, this has got to be the best film I've ever seen. And I'm just really happy Yorgos delivered um, because it is, it's worrying when you're watching a film after seeing the trailer, after doing all the pundits and stuff, you know, like you go in with expectations and I love watching films, not knowing anything about them. Um, I think it's such an interesting way to discover a film. Yeah, I mean, I was I was lucky in that I grew up in Seattle and we had one of the oldest uh, ongoing film festivals in the world. But, you know, I would when I was a kid, I'd get a, a an annual pass and I would see 200 movies in the month of May and June. And I wouldn't know anything about them because they wow. were all Pacific Rim countries. They were from all over the world. Yeah. And, and um, you know, since I left and moved to California and went to college, I haven't had those experiences 
where yeah, I could California, just sit down. Like you are eating, breathing films there. Wow. But it's hard. It's you, you. It's hard to get unless films get picked up for distribution. Yeah. It's hard to get, or you go to a Lemley Theater or something like Greg Lemley, and that family is still showing a lot of world cinema. But it's hard to find movies unless it's award season from yeah. all over the world. I mean, we we do have a small Indian community, well, a big Indian community here. So Bollywood movies will play theatrically. There are yeah. places where you can go chi see Chinese films in the theater. Yeah. But you have to seek it out. It's tough, and to find a a film from from Pakistan like yours, uh, you know, I don't remember In Flames playing here. It might have. It might. It have. hasn't yet. We did like a couple for your consideration screenings, but um, it hasn't released in the states as yet. We're releasing in April. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm excited to get to bring the film to North American audiences. Uh, we had our U.S. premiere at Palm Springs a few weeks ago. Oh, nice! And that's a great it, festival. It was it was tremendous to be there. A, it's so beautiful, um, and really the audience is really experienced cinephiles. Yeah. So sharing the film with them, it, it, it's the second time the film is screened in some ways in North America. We we had our world premiere TIFF. I mean our North American premiere TIFF. And for me, whenever I'm screening in Flames North America, it feels like a halfway homecoming because I grew up between North America and Pakistan. So I feel like in some ways. The audience for the film it resonates better in those two countries right you know because it's pieces of me so well you know i'm curious i want to delve back into when you first started making films did you learn camera techniques were you editing what was it like for you to start delving into the medium of cinema i mean i was doing it all which is stupid but you learn it all that way yep you know the first short film i made i used my student loan money to uh, buy myself like a Canon T3i. Nice. And I got all my friends and I'm like, we're gonna make a movie. Um, and I wrote a short film and then they were they were like friends who were actors and were acting in the industry in Pakistan. And they were like, you know, you need more than you and one person, right? And I'm like, why? <laughs> um, and then I deeply discovered why. Um, but it was kind of like this organic way of just leveling up and getting bigger by, you know, doing project by project. And one thing I continue to do to this day is I edit my movies, even yeah. within frames. I worked with a co-editor, but I did the initial assembly on the film and I also did the first pass edit. And then I gave it to him to do a second pass, Craig Sporgy, who's now nominated for a Canadian Screen Award. <laughs> um, and then we did the third pass together. Because I love, I feel like editing is like the final, um, the final writing of the film. Yep. For someone who's so deeply involved in the process, it's not something I can let go. And I tell my editor, you want me to do the first pass because it's where I see all my own mistakes. Yeah. Otherwise, if you do the first pass, I'm going to be like, why can't we fix this? Um, but yeah, it was learning about all departments in a really organic way. Um, and then um, being attracted to writing, to directing, to editing um, as where, you know, really the roots of the story both grow and kind of flourish. And then finding incredible collaborators along the way. And the journey of like our DP on In Flames, who this film wouldn't exist without Egil Nurbolatova, the journey of finding her came through me attending a lab in Korea meeting this incredible director from Kazakhstan whose films I watched being like, wow, these films are so beautiful. And then her connecting me with her cinematographer who's from Kazakhstan and her flying in when there's a revolution in Kazakhstan <laughs> to come and make our movie in Pakistan. So there's all these like tenuous kind of incredible things that had to happen for this film to exist. Well, I just love hearing you, you say that because that's kind of the way I hope the world will work. You know, one of the things I loved about going on the festival circuit, that's how you, like you just said, you meet people whose work that you like. Uh, I've only made one film, but I edited the film my DP shot. And I told him, I said, dude, if I ever make a movie, you're going to shoot it. You know, and you've, uh, that's, I think that's the best way. And plus, again, you, you have a, not a Western perspective, you know, and, and I think that's, that having other perspectives always sort of, I think, accentuates the work that you do, was there a language barrier between your DP and you? 
a little bit. Like English was our common language, but really our common language was movies. So when she arrived in Karachi, you know, we were watching films together that were the reference films for me. Um, what were what were some of those films? Uh, one is uh, Tuki Buki uh, by it's by Senegalese filmmaker. I think I, uh, Usman. Uh, I can't remember his last name, but he's like the father of modern day Senegalese cinema. Um, another film was The Big City by Sathya Jitre, who's yep. you know an icon. Um, and then more contemporary work like uh, Atlantiques by uh, uh, Maddie Diop, as well as uh, Titan by Julia de Carnot. Yes, that uh, which I, I I did read about you saying that that was an influence, and I'm like, that's yeah. interesting. Okay, okay. I mean, it's it's far away, but there's elements of body horror and in flames as well that's yes. definitely inspired by that work. Um, so it was kind of like you know marrying all of these different influences into what I saw to be the journey but yeah we we bonded over food and films and that's my favorite way to get to know people uh, and uh, then uh, we visited, you and me both <laughs> <laughs> and then we we visited all the locations i wanted to make the movie in and i remember after she read the script she's like you know okay i understand what you're trying to say because one of the things i told her is this film says everything i want to say about karachi and all about my experiences in karachi and then after we wrap principal photography, she's like, I understand what you're saying, because now I feel like I have seen the city from end to end. You know, I've seen it from the beach to the urban to like schools to hospitals. Like, I feel like I have an idea of this place. Um, and her lens is so incredible. And it was really important for me to have a female lens behind the camera, because mm. given the fact that the film is dealing with femininity and the, the female experience. I feel like the D, the DP is really the eye into the world. And it's the director's job mostly to craft performance and also to lead the team. But ultimately, the eye is female. Um, and that was a choice that me and my producer, Anima Boss, were thinking about at very early stages. Right, right. And I think it definitely, it definitely comes through. Now, how... After your shorts and traveling around the world, how did you finance In Flames? Was oh, it was a nightmare. Yeah. It was a nightmare. <laughs> um, so initially, we thought we would go through the European co-production route, which is something that a lot of Asian filmmakers do these days, mm -hmm. where they're able to access funds from global funds, like, you know, a little bit from here, a little bit from here, a little, and like piece it all together. Um, to the point that, you know, it ends up being quite an expensive production. Like it would, you know, run maybe like uh, just under a million. And a friend of another Asian filmmaker I know from Malaysia did this very successfully. But it requires producers who are really adept and have navigated that system before. Mm. My producer is incredible, but this was also her first fiction film. So for both of us, we're on this journey of making our first fiction film. She'd made feature documentary, but never fiction. And then we were in Berlin attending another lab where we met a Canadian, an Indian Canadian producer named Sean Joshi. Um, and he was like, you guys both hold Canadian passports. Yes, you both live in Pakistan, but you're both dual nationals. So you should consider doing this through the Canadian system. So Canada has a grant for first features, which is a micro budget first feature grant. Um, and because of the success of my short films, I was able to tap into that. Yeah. So we were kind of, we're 100% Canadian financed um, through, largely through Telefilm Talent to Watch. And then we picked up small pieces through other federal and provincial funding. Nice. But really operating on a very tight budget, even by Pakistan standards. Um, but yeah, that was how we were able to make this film because um, making films like this uh, is rare in Pakistan. You know, we're now starting to see more and more films and in some way we're having a Pakistani renaissance. But we also really benefited from changes in the Canadian financing sure. landscape, which came as a result of BLM. So the Black Lives Matter movement spilled over into Canada in which suddenly there was more opportunities for racialized creators like myself to tell stories in our terms. Wow. So, so many things had to happen in the world to allow us to make this movie. Now, Pakistan is predominantly Islamic. Yeah, it is. So, so what what I found really interesting is maybe I just because I've I've been interested in in I haven't seen a lot of 
films in my life coming out of Islamic countries, and I've sort of been on an Islamic film tear. And I think it started with a Turkish horror film called Baskin that I, I saw. Seen it. Oh it's man, it. it's uh, it's on disc. I I saw it on Netflix. It's okay. hard. It's hardcore. I mean, it was like a Cl- talk about body horror. Clyde Barker. It starts out. It, I, yeah. I, I I didn't Baskin. know what ba- Baskin B A S K I N, which I think is police raid or something. I I don't know what the word okay. means. But it was one of these movies. A friend of mine kind of like wink wink nudge nudge. You should watch this movie, but don't read anything about it before you watch it. Okay, and I'm well. like, I'm like, okay. And I, I, I thought it was just about a bunch of racist cops. Mm. It's more than that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you know, it was a horror film. And then, you know, I recently told you I watched uh, Ali Abbasi's Holy Spider, mm-hmm. which, which was interesting because it's it was a docudrama based sort of based on a true story, mm-hmm. but it deals with the the horrible injustices of the patriarchy of iran and one of the things that i when i started watching a movie again not knowing anything about it you know oh it's a family they've just lost the you know the head of the family and and i thought it was going to be like a mother and daughter bonding experience even though it was called in flames so i'm like does this mean their life's going to go up in flames like i didn't know but about 15 minutes in there's this great sense of dread that started to descend into the into the story and then i realized oh this isn't what i thought it was going to be and i thought you did a really great job drawing in the audience i mean me, meaning me <laughs> i mean you know you i'm a very experienced film watcher I've been watching films for a century you know and I, i'm seeing this thing and and i the sense of atmosphere that you created through the way karachi was presented the way this family is presented and what I thought was really great is that your lead actress, I mean, first of all, she's she's beautiful, but she was always dressed in she was always wrapped up and 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 she looked very angelic in a way in this environment that might not necessarily have been a place where an angel is supposed to be. And and that was something it's that where tough angels are. It's well, a it's a hard city that makes that needs hard people. Yes, and uh, this was something I'll, I'll tell you what really uh, struck me, and when it really like, it was the scene where she was driving by herself, yeah. and and she stopped, and obviously she she's going to school, she's studying, and she's very serious about it. But a guy in the middle of the day smashes her or the the window of the car in with a brick, and is trying yeah. to grab at her because, and then I'm like, oh, because you forget, she's yeah. not supposed to go out. Un, yeah. unaccompanied you know and 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 because of the the rules of 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 an islamic country and and then it made me realize oh this is a malevolent dangerous place for her and her family and i mean, I, th- I, I would caveat that pakistan is muslim majority and islamic but it actually has a dual government system going yeah. one which is british which is a legacy of colonialism and in that system which is like part of the legislation that you can tap into on the books we have incredible rights for women sure incredible rights for women in like human resources you know it's one of the few countries in asia to have a female head of state um but that being said culturally um there's a different set of expectations sure so that's why you see this kind of dichotomy where part of you know we, you'll see women driving in Pakistan in urban centers, but simultaneously there's this cultural backlash of patriarchy. Yeah. And that's what Mariam, the lead, is fighting against. Her dreams, which she knows are possible technically, and the culture that tries to repress her. Yeah, I mean, now, I, I uh, is it true that you had made a short film with the same character but played by a different actress? It is true. Um, it is. So uh, I made Dia in 2018, which was kind of my breakout short. And that actress, both the actresses were initially attached to the film. Um, only one of them was able to take it on, uh, Bakhtawar Mazur, who plays the role of Fariha, the film, The Mother. Um, she was great, too. She for, So for both of the leads in In Flames, this is both of their feature film debut. For Ramisha, it's her first time being on camera. She's never been on camera before, so she's so incredible. And 
to have the opportunity as a director to work with people when they're at this stage in their career and we're all growing together. And the reviews that both of these actresses have gotten, it's been such a soul affirming journey. Um, yeah, I mean, Ramisha's incredible. So is Bakhtawar. They're, they're just going to skyrocket from here. You know, I've been happy. I've been part of it. You know, here's the thing. Uh, casting, people tell you that, you know, casting is <laughs> nine-tenths of the process. How, I thought this film was extraordinarily well cast. All of the actors just, they brought that, again, verisimilitude. They were all believable. What was the process like for you to find your cast? How, how did you go about casting them? Were they people from the theater? Were, how did that work for you? So because my company and I've been living in Karachi for the last 10 years making short films, most of this cast I've worked with before in short films. I'm the kind of person where like, if I like someone and they're talented, I kind of never want to let them go. Sure, absolutely. So I've worked with Bakhtawar in like two shorts, Adnan Shah Tipu, who played the role of Uncle Nasir in one short, Muhammad Ali Hashmi in two shorts, who played the role of Salim. Um, a lot of the people are people that I kind of met as I was developing my voice as a filmmaker. And then Ramisha was the one person who, you know, we lost our lead because of uh, like uh, stuff that she was going through. She wasn't able to stay in the film about two months out. And we, my casting director, Muhammad Ali Hashmi, who also plays the role of Salim in the film, you know, he sent out a notice in his own kind of theater network. And around, I'm going to say two months before shooting, we met Ramisha through like a Zoom where I had my shitty box on internet and she had her shitty box on internet. And like, I can't really see her. But I remember after those 45 minutes just being like entranced. And I'm like, if this is what she can do over a Zoom audition, I don't even know the capability of this person in person. And then I remember the first time we met, which is when she came in for a table read. And in person, you know, at that point, now she's grown a lot as we've been traveling with the film. But at that point, she was this very quiet presence, you know, really intimidated to be in the space. And then the second she started reading her lines, she transformed. So I think, you know, with her, it really is, there's a lot of overlap in her own personal experiences with this role. Mm. Um, being an eldest daughter who lives in Karachi and just her having this kind of wealth of experience. But I, I lucked out with the cast because they're all so incredibly talented and each of them brought so much to their role. And they're also all really lovely people. Like... They're all people that now we've been traveling with the film for a year and a half, and I'm so grateful to see all of their journeys, you know, um, through this film. Like, when we met in Cannes, um, it was after I'd come to Canada to do post-production for the film, and at that point, it was this really incredible reunion where we had team members from Canada, from Kazakhstan, from Pakistan, all meeting for the first time in this, like, grand pantheon of cinema. And it honestly felt like this really strange fever dream. Um, but it was magical, and it's something only movies can do. Well, I have to say, I mean, I mean, she was, uh, it's Ramasha? Ramasha? Ramisha. Ramisha. Rami Ramisha. Ramisha. She's on screen basically the entire film. You know, yeah. seldom. I mean, there's a few scenes, like when the mother goes to see the lawyer. and uh, But she's extraordinary. I mean, her face is is you can't take your eyes off her face and it, there's such a soulfulness in her and you can see that that she's kind of a woman out of time and a woman out of place but yet she's constrained by where she where she lives i mean i was like <laughs> when the movie was over i'm like i really hope she gets to go to medical school and maybe they'll make a like an uh, the karachi version of er and she'll run the hospital <laughs> like her character i would love that i mean you I, I kind of like this <laughs> rape make the apu trilogy but make it about her like and like or like twenty eight up. You'll 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 make a film about her like every twenty years about where she's at in her life. Because I know love. What? You don't have to ask me twice. That sounds fantastic. I would watch <laughs> that every twenty years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of like Boyhood or or uh, or uh, the 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 after after the yeah, link trilogy. link ladder trilogy. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, but but make like the Apu trilogy. So we'll be watching it in film schools. Well, I won't be, but students will be watching it like the Apu trilogy, decades to come. But yeah, her, you know, her Ray did so much and gave us so much. Um, he's definitely a filmmaker that I, he's like, I feel like 
just incredible. I don't know how he did it. You know, like that kind of perseverance. Now that I'm in the business side of things, oh yeah, I don't know how he turned out so many films. Me neither. <laughs> and 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 you know, the Apu trilogy is still as re- resonant today as it was when it was made, what sixty yeah. years ago or something. Um, yeah. uh, one person I, I've got to uh, I have to single out in the film um, is I guess you would call him your main vi- would he be the main Uncle Nasser? So he's famous in Pakistan. That guy, I mean, I'm sure he's a lovely man, but what a dick, yeah. man, man! Did I and and she says Miriam says, don't sign the papers, just don't yeah. sign anything. Yeah. And I would, you know, I was. It was one of those things where where. The tension in that, I'm just like, you know, that was when I started to really clench up. The idea of paper, I'm like, yeah. don't do it. I mean, you, yeah. you, even, it's funny because there aren't horror tropes that you would normally expect, yeah. but you don't lean into those yet. The suspense, you know, I was like clenching up as I watched the film going, Oh my yeah. God. And it, like, you, like I was saying, the sense of dread you create in the, I mean, here's just this daily environment. It's, it's, I guess you'd say it's mundane city life. Yeah. But, but it can be, but suffocating. <laughs> and that was something I really wanted to capture. And I remember when I saw the film after quite a while and we were watching in a cinema, I remember after it ended, just kind of like being like, whoo, like kind of like, like a breath of relief. Because, yeah, it's it's a tough watch, and it is capturing all the beauty of Karachi, but it's also capturing the horror and how you can feel trapped. Oh, man. Um, I mean, every time somebody would go into, like, uh, your, I guess, your white knight, your knight in shining armor, the character um, Assad, and it, it's funny because he starts out like this knight in shining armor, but then he immediately is like, well, why didn't you answer my friend request? And I'm like, and he he was he like I guess like you came from Canada. I was living in Canada, but I moved back here, and and then immediately you're like, oh, even he's scary, yeah. you know. And 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 it, it, what I wanted to say with that was kind of like I feel like having grown up between two very different parts of the world, I really believe people are a product of the societies that they're from. Hundred percent. And you can only be as good as what that society expects you to be and the character of Asid is being the knight in shining armor as is the expectation from the society that he now he now finds himself in and he's kind of playing a character in some ways and then eventually we see him realize that Mariam does not need a savior right. she will save herself no and I and I, I and you see that Usid is how you pronounce his name. I apologize yeah. for my pronunciation, oh, no, you know, but <laughs> but but I I I really liked that you know the character and how you, I mean I guess it's because you don't realize we have people here in America. It's like well smash the patriarchy. I'm like you don't even know what a patriarchy is compared to what you see in these in these cultures like Holy Spider and this film. And I only equate them because I've watched I watched Holy Spider within the last month. Totally. And, and so, you know, you're both coming at it from different directions, but it was it was rather terrifying to see how trapped, you know, these women are. And one of the one of the scenes that really got to me was when the mother goes to see a lawyer. Like, look, I'm getting kicked out of my. I've been I've been completely swindled by my own family member. You know, I'm getting kicked out of my house, and I need I I know I need your help. You know, and the way you play that when she reaches out and and yeah. and take, I mean, we it, it's very subtle, but it's obviously very you know exactly what's going on there. And I'm like, I was infuriated. I was infuriated that this this woman has done nothing but shown she's a a, a, a mother and she's done nothing but be a good mom, you, like you would expect, and she's allowed her daughter to be independent and study and and be her own person. So you, I found her to be very sympathetic, and I really yeah. liked her, even though she was a little, you know, she wasn't. Yeah. She thought, oh, well, it's going to be fine. She wasn't um, doing enough. She wasn't. She wasn't street smart in the way that she needed to be. No, she wasn't. And and I understand that because she wasn't maybe allowed to be because of the life she was leading. Her daughter was, though. You know, and yeah, she said, I don't. I think it's also like if 
you know, the mother had like a destabilizing trauma, which kind of resulted in her pulling back from the world in a lot of ways. Sure. And it made Mariam kind of have to carry a lot of the burden of keeping their family together. And, you know, when someone has to do that, they have to be street smart. Uh, and with, you know, when we talk about the patriarchy, one of the reasons I stayed on the journey of making the film was having, being rooted in both, you know, Pakistan and North America. I remember when Roe versus Wade got overturned and my sister lives in the States and just being like, wow, things are changing everywhere. Yeah. And systems of oppression, which is what the patriarchy is, but every country has their own version of a system of oppression. Sure. Um, it felt like there was a need for this film to be made and for it to come out because it felt like we were seeing similar systems everywhere with like slight differences, you know? Right. Or different. Uh, the, the emphasis is in different areas on different yes, things. Exactly. But I mean, now let me ask you, you, you brought up the idea of body horror. Now, yeah. one of my favorite directors and the king of body horror is our favorite Canadian director, David Cronenberg, who, who I've been watching his films since I, again, I was a kid. The first time I saw, the first movie I saw of his was his first feature. It's called yeah. They Came From Within Here, but Shivers in Canada mm -hmm. from 1975. And then yeah. I've been, I mean, The Brood is still, I think, one of the great movies ever made about the destruction of, of a marriage that also yeah. is an incredible horror film, literally about how do you take internal trauma and externalize it. Yeah. I mean, the, the man's a master and I, he's, Got a new movie coming out. I can't wait. Called see called the Shrouds. But you brought up body horror, and there's a couple of instances like when they go see the the healer. Mm -hmm. Um, man, that was hard. That was so creepy, and I was, it was not easy to shoot either. <laughs> I I can only imagine. I mean, now that's another thing. You the this film was really great because you know you never went too far, but you were able yeah. to find the horror in the everyday. And sort of amp, and that was one of those things where it was so extraordinarily violating and creepy, and the way you shot it. How how did you like in your own mind from from writing it and then working with your cinematographer, and then as you said, doing the first pass editorially when you approached a scene like that? Um, and let's just say it involves somebody uh, unwantingly violating someone else's personal space. Yeah. I'm not going to say. How did you approach doing that scene? I think it's because and was it written that violation way? can be such a small thing. Yeah. But the psychological impact of it can never leave you. And that was definitely a guiding light, but also knowing that we wanted the violence to be inflicted this is awful on the audience. We wanted the audience to be knee deep in the violence, not expose our characters to it. So when you're witnessing the violence in this film, you're seeing it on the characters' faces. And the characters' eyes are your eyes. Right. So we're not seeing the violence in a wide, but we're seeing it happen to them, and we can kind of enjoy that violence. And that was one of the issues, to be honest, I had with Holy Spider, where we were looking at the violence in some ways voyeuristically. Oh, my God. Uh, yes, uh, 100%. And, and it really was really hard to watch. That, watching that film. Because I want the audience to be the one uncomfortable, not the audience to be, you know, in some ways titillated by the violence that we see on screen. Mm. And that's another aspect. That's one of the like darker aspects of horror cinema, of the legacy of what horror cinema has been. Yeah. Sure. And for us, the film, you know, the horror is the shown on the faces of our two leads. And that's really something that I wanted, uh, it was a conversation me and my DP were having when we were creating our shots and considering what's the impact of the film and who do we really want to make uncomfortable. And unfortunately, well, it's the audience. Well, no, I think fortunately, I think it was a great approach. Um, even the accident in the film, there's an accident in the film, y You, it was not... It's just here, it's, you know. And, and you, you're not, it's not voyeuristic at, at all. Um, and you know, one, one of the things that I really liked about what your approach was, you could look at it and say it was psychological, like it was in her mind, maybe, you know, even though, 
or not. I mean, you clearly, you, you kind of, but in a way, you leave it up to the audience, however you, whatever you're going to bring into the movie and the way you want to approach it, you could say, okay, this is very much rooted in reality. Or there's definitely a, a, a fantasy element to it if you choose to accept all of that. And, and it was, I really appreciated that approach because it was, for me, it was unexpected when I watched the movie. But, but the, the sense, I, I guess I'd have to ask you about Karachi. First of all, how was Karachi as a production partner? Was the, was the city open? Could you, do you have to get permits? Uh, and, and did you have to like have a first AD block off the streets? And were you using, what about extras in scenes? How, how was that? Um, so I've been shooting short films in Karachi for the last 10 years. So kind of learn how to navigate a place, you know? There is an aspect of permits where you work with a local police station, and we definitely had police coverage uh, when we were shooting some of our larger scenes. Mm -hmm. um, we were also shooting in some locations that have never been shot before, like that really oppressive apartment building where you know you can't see the sky and the buildings go up forever. I mean, God, man, when we finished shooting there, we were like all breathing easier. We were there for a <laughs> week, and it, it you felt really like I'm trapped. How do I get out? Right. Um, and no one had ever shot there. Um, Karachi for me is like, you know, I feel like all my I'm very pro making short films because my short films really I shot at a lot of the locations and did a lot of the things that I wanted to test out in my feature. So, you know, I'd shot at the beach before I'd shot in open highways. We did have a great AD team. There were three ADs together who were navigating people and closing off sets because we had some really difficult scenes, you know, that like were uh, in densely urban spaces where we yep. were doing things that um, we can't have a lot of people watching. So there was definitely an aspect of, you know, telling everyone we're shooting a mayonnaise commercial, which for the Pakistani version is like saying we're just shooting a TV drama um, because there's this bustling TV drama industry. It was a 30 day shoot. Um, we did have COVID halfway through. Um, and then had to kind of, but we didn't have the budget to close down. So we had to restructure. So that talent who got COVID, you know, could now take two weeks to test negative and return at the end. We're lucky it was a minor supporting character. Um, I got my first migraine while we were making this movie. Oh no. But it was, I mean, now it's been two years. We shot it in February, right before I turned 31. So we start, started shooting February 1st and I just want to go back to set. I'm like itching, like to get back. Um, but it was uh, it was a dream and a nightmare. Yeah, it was both. <laughs> well, I mean, look, people say sometimes that the city is a character in the movie too, and I would definitely say there's even some uh, uh, Karachi was that, but there's even I, I really liked it was sparing, but you used some drone shots, you know, where you got uh, and look, I think that when people look back at the cinema of the aughts. And the teens of the early part of the 21st century, people are going to talk about well the overuse of drone shots. Yeah. I don't think you did that in this film. I thought your you had a very judicious use of what drones brought you, and all they did was accentuate uh, what you were doing. And they seem to be very deliberate. You know the shots. I hate you... drone shots. I hate drone shots. So my DP was really fighting for them, and I. Uh eventually relented when i saw the footage in the edit right and i'm like it expands the scope of this story yes and it places mariam in some ways it almost expands her isolation the isolation of her and her family 100 percent. because you're like oh wow they live there's so many people here but there's no one who can help and it's somehow just still them so i was very anti it um but i'm really grateful we got that footage well, one of the things that struck me too is is that there you cut to when they're going to the beach the first time, and there's like a drone shot from above, and you see them going through the the, the rocky road that takes them to the beach. And what I I was like taken aback, like wow, because you're in this oppressive Karachi, and then all of a sudden you're in the you're in like freedom. the desert in freedom, yeah. and and the juxtaposition of that, the image was was yeah. I, I was jarring, and I, I thought it was great. I'm like. Yeah. There's a beach this close to Karachi? <laughs> you know, yeah, you're like, 45 minutes out, man. You can you can um, go there on a scooter? <laughs> and, and it was, yeah. again, it's, it really, uh, it's, it was a sense of place and time. And you're, you did such a good job of, of conveying that 
to the audience because for me, every time you went to a different location or a new establishing shot, I'm like, where are they now? You know, and I think you did a fantastic job of 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 being evocative of what Karachi's actually like. You know, I felt like I I could, aside from you know tasting it or smelling the the, the what it smells like. I mean, I want to know like what does the food smell like in Karachi? Obviously, you can't do that in a movie. But um, Your next film will have a lot of food. Yeah. I love Miyazaki films, which I feel like are a food tour of Japan right. through animation, and I am definitely being like I missed an opportunity there but Robert this has been so lovely I really love speaking to you about the film I I do have to run um but thank you so much for your insight and for taking the time to speak with me about our small Pakistani film well listen thank you uh, it has been so great to speak with you the movie is in flames it's going to be coming out in April who's releasing the film it's being released by Game Theory Films. Okay. And so we'll be able to see it in uh, nationally across the United States? Uh, right now we're looking at a limited release across New York, Austin, L.A., and Chicago. Well, listen, it has been so great. Zarar Khan, thank you so much for being here on the Designing Hollywood podcast. And thanks very much to our sponsor for this episode of the Designing Hollywood Show, the Costume Rentals Corporation. The variety of costumes at Costumes Rentals Corporation is expansive. CRC is recognized worldwide as the premier supplier of military and police costumes and uniform rentals. Costumes Rentals Corporation takes pride in its commitment to each customer, helping to produce the type of exceptional look needed for a successful production. A special thank you to founder and executive producer Martika Ibarra, co-founder, costume designer, the legendary Marilyn Vance, and of course, John Campia from The John Campia Show. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, tune in to the audio version wherever you listen to podcasts. I am, of course, your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and you can find me on Instagram at rmburnett, or find me on Twitter at burnettrm, or on YouTube at postgeeksingularity. Thanks very much. Like, subscribe, and give us your comments. What would you like to see on the channel? Right down below. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode of Designing Hollywood.